Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne Hazard, and somehow I drew the short straw this morning, so I'm, I'm here to, uh, to, to address you. Uh, this is uh, the, the State and Local Assets on Transportation breakout session, and uh, we are honored today to have the uh, Honorable Shannon Valentine, who is the Secretary of Transportation, to address us. So uh, I'd like to give you some of the information about her bio. So Shannon Valentine was appointed Secretary of Transportation by Governor Ralph Northam in January of 2018 and oversees a $5 million multimodal, multimodal transportation system crossing seven agencies with more than 10,000 employees. Ooh. As Secretary, she also serves as Chair of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Valentine is a former member of the Virginia House of Delegates, serving on the House Transportation and Courts of Justice Committees. Following an assignment as Director of the Transportation Policy Council in 2013 for then-Governor-elect Terry McCullough's transition team, Valentine was appointed as Lynchburg District Representative to the CTB Board in May of 2014. During this time, she created the first regional connectivity study in Virginia that correlated transportation decisions with workforce, business expansion, and recruitment and investment, covering eight modes of transportation. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Virginia in economics. She graduated from the Soroson Institute at UVA and completed education for ministry at four-year theology course through Sewanee University's the uh, School of Theology. Can we give Secretary Valentine a round of applause? I'm going to move down and let uh, Secretary Valentine take over and uh, so I can watch the movie. Can you all hear me? Yeah. So I thought it would be, a, I felt so far away I could hear. I'm Shannon Valentine. For those of you in the room who may not know me, I am a mom, I was a businesswoman, <clears throat> I worked with low-income families for about 25 years of my life on education issues, transportation, economic development. I did serve in the Virginia House of Delegates, an assignment for which I still believe I deserve hazardous duty pay. <laughs> <laughs> I um, was a co-director with Mike Edwards, who I think many of you know, um, for Governor McCullough's transition team on transportation policy. Uh, I was named to the Commonwealth Transportation Board in May of 2014 and appointed to this position in January. I feel as though I have been doing this for a long time. I will just share you, tell you that my favorite stories um, actually come from my time in the General Assembly. I happen to have been in a special election. Um, I won on a Tuesday night and I was driving to Richmond for the first day of session that went second Wednesday in January and I was in an elevator going up to the fifth floor in the um, GAB building which is now completely demolished and so I was going up and I was riding in an elevator with one of my very favorite Republican friends, legislators, who I, had, I didn't know at the time, um, riding up and he's remained a, a really good friend for a long time and so I was in the elevator and just congratulating me and saying, gosh, welcome to the General Assembly. And he said, I would like to share with you the wisest words that were shared, that were shared with me when I first heard. And he said, for the first two weeks, you are going to wonder how you are. And then for the rest of your life, you're going to wonder how they got there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that does not need to go on the table. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Okay. Um, for those of us who work in transportation, we feel we are coming in at a very important time. It is wonderful for us because we feel as though we can hit the ground running. We are building on so many transformations that I think probably many of you have actually participated in creating. We have the smart, we have smart scale, we made a commitment to state of good repair. We have reformed our P3 process for transparency and accountability. And today we actually had a six-year improvement plan. For many years we moved balances on a spreadsheet. Today, to get into our six-year plan, you have to be funded to be completed. That's how the system works. And we are producing far more projects than, I'm not sure in the history, but certainly in a very long time. 
today coming into this position now, our team, and I am joined by Marsha Herman today from my office, um, who works in communications and is working with the new Office of Innovation, Transportation Innovation. Um, we really believe that our legacy is going to be built on three levels. One is execution. Our 21, our six-year improvement plan just for surface transportation is $21 billion over the next six years. 3,700 projects. We have to deliver those projects with excellence. That is going to be a huge part of the history that we do. Two, more deliberately tying transportation decisions to economic development and competitiveness. Sometimes it seems very easy if you're in the urban crescent to see it. I think it's more important in outside the urban crescent, which I choose to call the part of Virginia, making that connection. And lastly, by embracing innovation. I was given permission very early on to open an office of transportation innovation, really for two reasons. One, to solve transportation challenges. And two, to make sure that commerce around the world knows that Virginia is open for business. And so we have this, it's a nine minute video, but you'll see all the things that are taking place. It was just open at the end of May. And I think you'll see that there's a great deal of energy within the Department of Transportation crossing the entire segment area. And really the platform that we are all creating across our common so with that, I think we can show the video. What does innovation mean to me? What does transportation innovation mean to me? Well, that's easy when you're on a spaceport. Innovation is what we're all about. What does innovation mean to me? It's creating an environment for our 7,700 employees in the Virginia Department of Transportation to unleash their ideas and bring those to the forefront. It's about trying to do things better with the resources that you have and looking for new ways of doing things. It's about new technologies, it's about breaking down barriers, and it's about bringing people along with you so they know what you're doing. Transportation innovation from our standpoint is customer service. How can we do more for customers at a one stop? For aviation, innovation means being open to new ways because the world is changing very much. The future of the industry is going to be very challenging. The business as it is now is changing day to day. You have to be looking forward, not back. Innovation is part of our core values, so we have approached everything we do from a perspective of innovation. And innovation is where you tie a brilliant idea or concept with a strong need and is able to make a difference. It's also working with the private sector to create efficiencies or new ways of doing business. Asking the questions, why? What if? What if we do it in a new way? I believe our legacy is going to be built on three pillars. Tying more deliberately transportation decisions to economic opportunity and competitiveness, executing and delivering superior projects, and embracing innovation. Innovation means that Virginia will be the number one state in this great country of ours in which to do business. That means that we have to have a world-class transportation system right here in Virginia. And we have a talented group of individuals led by Shannon Valentine. Uh, she is doing a wonderful job and I, did, I couldn't be prouder to be governor of Virginia and to make sure that we have the number one economy in this country. I was very excited that I was able to open an Office of Transportation Innovation. 
from the Port of Virginia, the spaceport, rail, transit, highways, bridges, barges, ferries, aviation, we have 66 airports in Virginia. I really saw such opportunity. If we were able to learn from each other, inspire each other to solve transportation challenges and to help us to be even more competitive economically. things we know is to be competitive in the world stage, you have to build on your foundation that's here, but apply the best technology. So we said innovation isn't a nicety, it's a necessity, because it's the thing that will make you sustainable. How do we maintain our competitive advantage? In my opinion, it's really through our employees and our workforce. Planning for the workforce of tomorrow is paramount today. Most of the innovations that we've come up with recently uh, come from the staff members themselves. Inspire innovation within the Motor Vehicle Builder Board is not really that difficult because I have a lot of people who have a lot of ideas all the time. It's just a matter of sitting down and picking which one we want to do next. So the Research Council has always been about innovation, about finding new methods and materials to deliver transportation, and the people who work here are really internally motivated. They want to make things better. They're some of the most energetic people I have ever met, and they're constantly pushing the boundaries. Um, which can make people uncomfortable. It's easy for any government agency to slip into bureaucraties, to just say no. We at the Virginia Department of Aviation refuse to just be bureaucrats saying no. We want to be entrepreneurs helping Virginia's airports be the best they can as the economic development front door for the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. We are not a destination. We are part of the supply chain. So we have to connect Virginia to the world and the world to Virginia because we're just a global gateway. Virginia has 500 lane miles of runways. Those 500 lane miles connect Virginia to the rest of the world. And business prospects from all over the world fly to Virginia's airports when they are developing their projects, exploring where to put a new project, and keeping their operations going. So the airport has to look like a place that is welcoming, professional, and ready for business. And we are working to make that happen. So when we looked at our intermodal connectivity, we really built our rail product. So we moved about 35% of our freight to and from the Midwest through this port. Then we turned around and we took on the Richmond Marine Terminal. So we have a river barge. And in FIP, where we have an inland port, there's been over 9,000 jobs created and economic investments up there approaching a billion dollars. And right now in Richmond, there's two and a half million square feet of development going on there today. That's something they haven't seen in a long, long time. One of the uh, latest uh, additions that uh, is a, a tremendous asset for Mars and for NASA as a whole here, we received funding for the Mars payload processing facility. It's a brand new facility. Uh, about 28 million dollars when completed and it will handle classified and the most precise and clean payloads that come along so it is bringing additional missions already and we expect it to bring two to three additional launches each and every year well there's so much uh, on the horizon uh, mobile driver's license is one that is actually able to transmit certain data fields with the customer's uh, consent uh, to the business to, to allow them to do whatever they need to do. Clearly, uh, from a, a vehicle standpoint, autonomous vehicles. Virginia uh, and VDOT and DMV worked uh, with Virginia Institute for Transportation Research to make sure that, that we could research autonomous vehicles on the track they've got down there. Automated vehicles have the potential to decrease crashes and in particular fatalities to almost zero. We've been striving for that for decades and now we have a real opportunity to actually get there by taking all of those crashes that are attributable to driver error out of the picture. Earlier in September, the governor and secretary uh, rolled out a dance, which is driver alcohol detection system for safety which is a revolutionary, uh, first in the world, uh, technology that when someone gets into a car, there are sensors that will analyze the breath, uh, and if in fact you're over the limit of 0.08, uh, the car will start to allow you to run the cruise buckets, heat or air conditioning, but it won't move. And the 
fact that it started here, the fact that our governor and our sector were able to announce it, uh, that's that's innovation. That's innovation that is going to save lives. Here in Virginia, we've been doing a series of hackathons, and it's really helped to meet uh, three main objectives. Our main objectives are to advance the deployment of connected vehicle, automated vehicle technologies, um, as well as advance smart cities throughout Virginia. We also are trying to promote and expose the data sources that we have available. And finally, the, we want to create these opportunities for collaboration. The interactions that we've been having within the communities, getting different technology leaders together to become excited about transportation data, it's been really exciting. And finally, we really want to kind of lead the national conversation on the need for these open data sources and the need for better data management because it's really important in how we move forward with connected vehicles and smart cities in particular, but all sorts of transportation issues more generally. Along the lines of innovation, some of the things that we're looking at on a bigger picture, at some point in the future, we're looking at the opportunity of implementing a dealer portal. We're hoping that this will give the dealerships ownership of their information. So this is something we hope to put in place here in the next couple of years. As many of you have heard me say, when you look at the Ports website, I want to wake up every morning thinking of ways to serve our customers better. That is how I would love to inspire our workforce, our partners, our leadership, to really solve the transportation challenges that we all face. The future of Virginia's transportation system is in our hands. This is our opportunity to grow our multimodal transportation network into the safest, most efficient, and most reliable, and most innovative in the nation, and most innovative in the nation, and the most innovative in the world. We are the platform for Virginia's economy, and we have the power to connect all Virginians to jobs, education, healthcare, and opportunity. Remember, our greatest innovations lie ahead of us. Our greatest innovations lie ahead of us.
that communication system, that broadband system is critical to making this all work. And so I was even saying, you know, maybe Evan and I should have been presenting together because in transportation we're not just moving people and goods, we are now moving data and information. So it's kind of thinking about what we're all doing. There's a focus on energy efficiency, electric vehicles, what that is going to require of our platform, and as a consequence, and I said this comes up today, our financial sustainability. It's looking at how we are raising revenue in transportation. The emerging role of unmanned systems, UIS, and incident management, infrastructure inspection, congestion, post event damage assessments, crash site, and environmental analysis an imperative for data governance and system security, the creation and expansion of open data portals, and deliverable applications for our citizens and businesses, the integration of transportation and logistics, how we get everything where it needs to be on time and in the condition we all expect. Um, and I would say the most unprecedented, unprecedented call for collaboration. Collaboration within government, Working with Evan Kleinman, the czar of broadband, commerce and trade, the EDP, um, the uh, Secretary of Administration for Security, all of us working together, natural resources, with rising sea level, making sure we and government are working together, and then the collaboration beyond it, with our partners, with the private sector, with our universities, making sure that we have. Um, the most reliable, dependable information upon which we are actually building a 21st century transportation system. So with that, I, I know you have some questions um, that you'd like to pose, and I just thought at this point we could just talk about some things, and I'd be happy to hear. I do have a lot to speak, but I'm <laughs> happy to, um, you know, take your questions and thoughts, and yes, sir. Yes. Can everybody hear the question? The, do you, you want to stand up? I think it okay. might be a little bit hard. <laughs> no, Talking about how automated things are at the port. You don't see people. <clears throat> right? It's, it's total automation. The only people are there are because of contracts like the longshoremen that have to keep their jobs so they do something that's totally ridiculous. They lower bottom <laughs> two feet onto the tractor trails but because of the, the union and everything. But my question is, with all this technology, the challenges we face on I-81, what is the price difference for mile of rail versus a mile of interstate. The reason I say that, why couldn't a interstate rail system be installed on I-81 and take every last long haul tractor trailer off the interstate, but in the right of way on a rail? I'd say and, it's, and, and you raise a great point, and it is part of the solution. Right, I mean, it, it is it's, part it's, of the it's, solution. And it's something that's to have a much more immediate impact as well as a long-term impact because you could put your drivers, the whole trucks on the rail, taking from basically one end of Virginia to the other end for a, uh, you know, a, a, a tariff fee. They're not burning fuel, trucks are shut down, no wear and tear on the tires, the engines, or anything else. Move them all the way through Virginia and just have the local truck traffic on the interstate. Coming up here yesterday, it was a wreck on 81, and everything was stopped. That never happened. No, that never happened. <laughs> and 95% of the traffic was tractor trailers. With all the technology and everything, it seems like this may be a much more viable solution than the <coughs> traditional. And uh, tell me your name. Uh, Jim Crozier. Hi, Jim Crozier. It's, it's, um, thank you for your question. I will tell you, I think it's an and. 
we, um, as part of the 81 study, which I did bring the, some information with me, we are integrating an intermodal, multimodal solution along the 81 corridor. Right now, Norfolk Southern does have a track that actually parallels 81. Today, um, 70 million tons of freight are moved along the 81 corridor. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, make a comment on that. Yes, yes. You're talking about Norfolk Southern. Any government agreement comes second to their freight customers. Go, go up to 95 corridor, come up uh, from Roanoke, up through Culpeper and everything, and Amtrak averages an hour's delay every day because they take second seat to the commodity transportation. To me, that's an issue using existing lines versus the Commonwealth installing their own bond that they own, that they have priority. Yeah, we in Virginia do not own the railways. I'm not I'm not opposed to that idea. We're actually looking at an opportunity across the Potomac to do that. It is a lot for the Commonwealth to take on. Um, I'm not sure the 81 Cooter would be the first place that we would consider it, but we are looking at a two-track bridge across the Potomac. Right now, Every passenger train, freight train, commuter train goes across a two-track bridge owned by CSX. This is important to know because it's at full capacity, which means I can't get another train until we address what we call long routes. What we're trying to do across the Potomac is build another second two-track bridge. The draft EIS is due in the spring of 2019. The Commonwealth is trying to figure out how we can fund it, which I'm sure we'll talk about funding. Um, DC DOT is actually taking the lead on the bridge, but it would be really the first time that we would separate passenger and freight. That has to happen before anything. I can't get another train. So in my own, people talk to me about getting into Christiansburg and Blacksburg. I've got to get this bridge done across the Potomac. So, but I think your idea is very interesting. Um, so right now, what we're going to do is actually build on some of the resources that we have. There are three pieces to the 81 study that are going to continue. One is the multimodal piece. Um, because we have programs like the uh, Rail Industrial Access Program. So we actually proactively working with businesses to create spurs to use more rail service along the border. Um, we have the uh, Rail Enhancement Fund. There are two companies, one's the Huff Corporation. They recently did the Rail Industrial Access Grant. That is moving 17,415 roads off of 81. The Shenandoah Valley Railroad just used the preservation funds. They're now taking 52,000 trucks off. It is a great deal of opportunity, but it is something that we have to do proactively. So multimodal truck parking is going to continue after this study and enforcement, uh, law enforcement along it. But I think it's an and. Um, the safety issues along the border are significant. Um, so it's, to me, it's an integrated multimodal solution, and your point is really good. Yes, sir. I'm going to follow up on that. I'm Ken Over Peterson from Hanover County. Yes, sir. We've recently been through issues with the rail along uh, the long bridge and all of the tracks all the way through Virginia, through Ashland. Oh, it's 323. For the record, 323. Our concern is what we're seeing is we talked about innovation. Yes, sir. Yeah, we talked about spending billions of dollars to increase capacity on technology that's already 75 years old. Instead of looking at new and innovative ways, you mentioned 81. Now, freight probably could not do it, but passenger could be elevated. Now, I do understand, uh, I asked a question uh, uh, recently with the DRPT as to why we couldn't run a rail down 95. In the right way, it's terrain. There is a different terrain design criteria for cars versus trains. But in an elevated situation, that would not be the case. Uh, so I guess my question is, why are we spending so much time and effort planning on spending so many billions of dollars on the system that's already in place and is already out of place? Well, you know, um, I would 
say we're trying to build on some of the assets we do have and try to transform. It's kind of what we did along 66. We knew we couldn't build our way completely out of all the congestion. 66, three years ago, was, I'm coming back to rail in a second, but it was, um, and I quote, uh, in the paper it said, the worst damn freeway in America. <laughs> and it was congested seven and a half hours a day. It's a very narrow footprint, which we have everywhere, along 95 as well. Narrow footprint, so rather than kind of building our way out, we're transforming it. We're transforming how we move people through the border. It's very much what we're trying to do along the 95 border as well. One is the express lanes, which with FedEx we're going to be taking it down to Fredericksburg. It's expanding VRE, which actually runs outside of Amtrak. So they have a different op operator than Amtrak on the VRE line. We're working with Amtrak right now. Has anybody here go to the rail committee meetings? Well, I, they meet um, every month along with, C with our CTV meetings. Um, but we are working with Amtrak to transform that system as well. Uh, they are making a lot of changes to how they do business. They're already working on the design of the rail cars. So we're moving in tandem along many fronts to improve it. The Atlantic Gateway, DC to RDA, I don't know if you all have heard these acronyms before, higher speed rail. Um, so we are trying to do that in a manner that is possible. So taking the assets, improving it, the efficiency of it. Um, I have not actually spoken to anyone about how we completely transform how we would do that, but I will say this, um, at the Governor's Transportation Conference, how many of you were there? Okay, were you there for the, Julie Brown was there. <laughs> Did anybody see the Hyperloop presentation in this room? Okay, it was tremendous, wasn't it? Now, I'm not saying anything of, and what that is is a, is a tunnel for those who, it's building a tunnel somewhere below ground, ground somewhere above ground. The technology is in um, various stages right now. SpaceX, which is owned by Elon Musk, is doing a competition. They're on the fourth round of this competition right now. Colleges and universities from around the world competed to design a tube or the pod for the Hyperloop. Out of thousands of universities across the world, there are a handful in the United States who are part of the final 20. Two of them are in Virginia, VCU and Virginia Tech. And those students came and presented what they were doing. Now, they'll be the first ones to say that we're gonna hit a tipping point with how we can do this better or more efficiently. We are not there yet. Um, but we, I think, have the resources and the ingenuity here in Virginia that perhaps we could be on the cutting edge of how that technology actually transforms. So I think we're, in our lifetime, we're gonna see a lot of changes. I don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but we're trying to build all of that into our decisions. I don't have an answer for what that is, but we are doing four tracks, you know, North Alexandria North, three tracks down to Fredericksburg through Ashland. We're doing 323, three, as you heard me say. So we, we preserve the town of Ashland. Um, so we're trying to transform how we travel. The thinking really is much more about how do we move people versus how do we move cars. So we're rethinking, given the limited um, assets that we have, limited revenue that we have, how can we rethink how we travel? And you know the Rona train, passenger train to Rona. Um, it is the largest stop in Virginia. I think Rona, Lynchburg, Charlottesville actually you know, have our highest performance, our highest ridership. Um, in fact, I think you know, even since we've extended the train, 200,000 people have ridden it. That's cars off 81. So passenger, and people love it. I tried to get a ticket from Thanksgiving to Boeing to Delaware could not. So one of my daughters and I are actually driving to Richmond to catch a train to going to Delaware. So it's tremendously successful. Now we're trying to see, can we get that train to Blacksburg Christmas Park? Anybody from there? So we're trying to get the train to move there. Um, one of my biggest obstacles, Long Bridge. That was a long way to come back to that, but we've got to increase the capacity 
over the Potomac into the Union Station. But it's integrated. We're all trying to work together. But all of this coming together, there's not one solution for anyone. I think it is a multitude of solutions working. I'm going to go right behind you and then we'll it's nice to see you. Yes, how are you? Um, the would you have any concerns from the transportation perspective that the primary media system that's used to navigate ships up and down just the Bay of James River uh -huh. from our county was shut off by the first part of that year? Now that you have aviation GPS that has no backup? Hmm. No, no one has mentioned that to me, but I will look into that. Yeah. Do you have concerns? Very much so. And so, what are they? Well, the concerns are basically, you know, so now we're using the aviation system to navigate ships up and down Chesapeake Bay and the James River from the ports and the Arkansas ports of Richmond. Um, the aviation system is very easy to jam with students, and which, you know, some point they're going to do some harm to the Commonwealth. Could scoop that she gives her easily and run the ships around. And now we're running through all of the James River, which is a great thing. I mean, it's good for our economy. It's great for Richmond. It is, absolutely. Yeah. For some reason, the federal government and their wisdom turned off the primary GPS that's used in that navigation. That GPS was also used by active yeah. also used by small airports. The airport in Ireland was devastated. Wow. But I think the big concern is, from the environmental standpoint, if you love one of the ships around, which has to be Yeah, I don't know that, but we'll take, yes, sir, did you want to respond to that? To explain on this question? Yeah. Um, I'm into the aviation, uh -huh. and the GPS technology, the constellation of satellites, is owned by the Department of Defense, and they do routinely turn it off and degrade the signal that's available to us auxiliary users, and that, until that issue can be resolved with it, you know, where the, the military doesn't need to turn it off from time to time or degrade it to do whatever they're doing. We shouldn't put too many eggs in that basket. Uh, because a couple of years ago, I was, I was flying to a breakfast, which is one of the things we do. And just all of a sudden, the autopilot disconnected because it was tracking the GPS signal and it just didn't know where it was. So, um, <coughs> That is an issue that needs to be addressed. Well, you know, I actually have a call today. Well, I know that Senator Warner's office is on this call, but I might go ahead and bring that just Because the concern, the concern I have about it is not with the aviation or the shipping, because you have a pilot there to take over and operate manually. Uh -huh. But with the smart driving cars that may be employing that system, oh, exactly. they definitely need an off switch on that feature. Quite a while. Well, imagine autonomous vehicles, you know, <laughs> uh, autonomous trucks. Autonomous, and, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so you know, you think about how. Uh, and I'm not a technology <coughs> but they do, you know, they work on the vision system with the reflectors that are going to paint on the lines and the augmented with the GPS signal so it knows where it is. No, that's really good. Thank it you. It devastate our economy. Mark Flynn, who was our county attorney, to use double the you know, was very much looking at this technology for rural airports. Yeah. How do we get commerce spread off of the town of rural right. airports? And, and the Coast Guard comes. That's really good. So, anyway, thank you yeah. for bringing that to our attention. I didn't get yeah. your name. You just saw it. Hold on one second. You have a question. Yeah, it's, it's not related to GPS. Oh, it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> so my question is, is that we've done a lot of work on A1. I've had all we come up with this large list of projects that we feel like we need to do. And my question is for this innovation option, are we going to look at innovative project delivery? Because in my experience, we've got a large list of projects. It'll be 20 years before we ever see all those projects. But again, based on the current requirements of project delivery and how we go about building those, uh, those requirements to go forward. So the need by then will change quite a bit, I think, in the project. So I think it's important when, we, when we're talking about specifically A1, 
but looking at innovative ways to deliver the projects. Because if we have funding today, we're going to see a project for five or six years. Well, let me say that that may not be true because depending on the funding sources along any one, we've identified more than $4 billion worth of units. It may be that we use more of a multimodal approach. We don't have to do all $4 billion. But we build a program around $2 billion um, along 325 miles. It's widening, it's, it's interchanges, it's shoulders. It, it really trying to make it much safer. If we did do this, it would save six million hours of delay a year and reduce the number of crashes by about 425 and 130 of those people. It's a very dangerous road. So regardless of what we do, I think we have to make a lot of these decisions are going to be made for safety reasons. Um, we've looked at truck tolls. We looked at a commuter annual pass. We have looked at the sales tax, we've looked at a gas tax. Um, we're actually running some numbers on a diesel fuel tax to see what kind of impact that might have. But our job is to do the homework and we turn this over to the General Assembly. That's it. We're doing the homework on this and what we could generate. But if you went with the tolls, and you could still do this with the authority as well, if you have a dedicated revenue source, tolls and the annual pass are actually backed by the credit rating of the Commonwealth, AAA bond rate. We could go to the market next year and actually get the money today to start building projects. So within a year, we could be out. Once we, could. we still have to design those projects and go through all the environmental hoops and go through all that process. And I think that's where we need some innovation to try to narrow that gap, you know. To deliver the projects. To deliver the projects. I got the funding. I know what the project is. Yes. And here I'm starting and I've got you know, all these different regulations and all this yes. permitting and all this that I have to do. And if I do that as fast as I can do it. Only, and you are right and you make a good point. I will say that some of these projects, I don't have the exact percentage of it on the books for a long time. There's been a lot of work on it. We haven't had the money to do it. So I think we, um, we could be in a position to, to actually move projects faster. And I think your... Um, recommendation about looking at how we deliver them and more innovatively is an excellent piece. Really great. One more comment on the NPS microphone. Yes. The 95 port. You go past Pony Go? Yes. Period. Nothing. That is an issue that the mm -hmm. FBI is the one that does that particular thing. But there's an issue on the federal government side of they do intentional blocking of all of the they need to get their bandwidth narrowed because of a homeless vehicle on 95. When they hit anywhere on this particular two mile stretch, they're dead in the wood. So, if that goes wrong, it's going to be Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Jay Lewis Rockridge County. Obviously, 81 is very important to us and um, topographically challenged, so yes, it is dangerous. But, and you touched on some taxes and some revenue. And I, while I'm frustrated with trucks, too, I think it's important to remember the revenue that they do bring to our localities. They move about $312 billion down 81 every year. We provide all of the yes. resources for our communities. So I believe in a comprehensive solution, you know, but I want to be cognizant of the benefit that they do bring. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much. And really, if we do our jobs right, the greatest beneficiaries right. will be the truckers, right? For safety, truck parking, lighting, truck ramps. Um, the Trucking Association has been really great to work with, and they too are looking for a more comprehensive solution and not just one. Uh, I'd like to just comment that I think it's good to be a positive way to the state commerce. One of the things from what we went through the steering committee, can you all hear? Can you all hear me? Yeah. I can tell, I can tell, I can see your face, and I can tell you, you're not hearing you. Yeah. And some of the local government issues are outside of the main part of the debate. I'd like to ask if two rounds of small scale funding allocation have to take the third on the way. Are there any changes in the process that BDOT and CPD will be considering for future rounds to reduce the time and cost of preparing the remaining applications? You mean faster than two years? Yeah. 
I mean, I, I think that's part of the problem that the rest, you know, us, secondary roads, all the other things that come into play, uh, the interstate area is important, but we also have local issues. Yes. Um, how many of you have been a part of Swartz Family Sunglasses and have input into it? Um, how many of you think it's a better system than what we have? Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> Remember, um, you know, really, in some cases, we had a 20 or 30 year improvement plan because honestly, we just moved the balance. So now to get in it, you actually have to complete the project, which is an advantage. Um, yes, sir? I was wondering, we were talking about 81 and 95 quarter, uh, and uh, I'll, we're not, uh, not forgetting the one that ties 85, 95, and 81, which is the 58 quarter and the bottom of the side of Virginia. And uh, this. Do you I, know, I love that road. Yeah. I travel it a lot. Mm -hmm. I was just on there the other day and like the three car. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. It's such a great quarter, and I know we need to expand it, but um, I was touring Berry Hill down in Pennsylvania County. and. Um, so anyway, trying to get a connector work, but I agree with you, we're working on the next day <coughs> idea, and I have a meeting about that coming up. So I agree with you, but that's really a very well done order, which we should take advantage of more. But as far as funding for um, the smart scale, I mentioned to you the impact of the gas tax. Among different things, we were actually taxing in a 20th century way for 21st century transportation. So, right? We all know this. Um, in the first round of smart scale, we had a billion dollars. In the second round of smart scale, we had 900 million. Third round, we're going to have that. And I don't know if you all saw Aubrey's presentation, but he may have brought this up yesterday, but he spoke to the money committees and he was talking about the impact on transportation. It's not going to be a gradual decline when we're young, and it's going to, we're going to hit the cliff. So part of VTrans are planning up and is looking at how can we create a sustainable funding, um, sustainable funding revenues for transportation. So we are beginning to work on that now. Again, we're going to be doing the homework. Um, we can't kick the can down the road anymore. Um, I, as far as how we choose projects, I think we should constantly look at how we fund these projects, um, especially with economic development. Um, it really feels that we are still missing something and trying to identify the projects have the biggest impact. Do you all think that too? Yeah, I'll give you an example. We had a project that arrived in the we had a project that we had to go to the we had a project that we had to go to the Yeah. I mean, well, and, and, and you know, let's face it, my city is going to add to the food for the revenue at all. I mean, they are costs. So it's just hard for us to realize that we No, but, uh, but it's the point. I don't know that particular issue, but they should have been funding out the tap. And not with that. But in any case, um, the point is right. You know, how we're funding a lot of smaller projects sometimes and not actually the ones that could create the greatest impact. So we're con it's a constant process. FAMPO um, folks from Projects Work came to see us. Uh, you guys are in Category A, so you compete with Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. Uh, so we're always trying to look at, you want to be as fair as possible, but also creating the impact that we're all hoping for. So I think it's something we have to continue to do. It's not going to end. Yes, sir. My question is more about the flexibility. Um, stormwater management is something that every project has to do anymore. And, and the differences in what's done in a more rural area versus what's done in a more urban area are really are are very, very different. Yeah. Uh, mine in particular is I'm in Mount Vernon, which is well, Potomac and Route 1 uh, goes through the middle of it. And we're doing a, frankly, a total revitalization of the highway and we are adding lanes and now we have to add stormwater management. But the prescriptions that we're getting with the design of it is more of what I would consider uh, what you might do in an area that has a lot of land that doesn't cost very much. And, just you know, a big hole in the ground, you put a fence around it, and 
and that's your stormwater management. But in an urban area, an urban corridor, it doesn't work. But the flexibility is, I understand it, we understand it, is not there. I know we've asked the question, I know they're looking at it, but I guess I wanted to just challenge you all to take a look at that and make sure that we have different standards, different guidelines for the, the value of the land that you're having to deal with. And in this case, we have to, we have, the best example I can give you is a, a little bit of a story, which we have an auto, uh, automobile dealer who has, is getting ready to revitalize his automobile lot. And the design of the Route 1 change is to put a big stormwater management on the front, right along the highway in front of his automobile dealership, which obviously doesn't make any sense at all. So they're working with that to change that, but <coughs> even now they're going to move it to maybe the back of a lot, but still, you know, he needs and they need a place to park a lot of cars and right. we need a way that's a little bit more innovative, more flexible. So what what's the process and how do we get those kinds of um, changes so that they reflect the needs of that particular area and not just kind of one size fits all? Yeah, I don't know. I will tell you that flexibility is an issue across the board for many decisions. Um, so I don't know how to make it more flexible. It doesn't make any sense to me to put that well in the front of a dealer. So I, I don't know the answer to your particular question, but that's something we can look at. My card? Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was going to bring it up. I'm from Hampton Road. It's pretty and I'm, I'm from the Hampton Road perspective, uh, our focus is 64. Uh, here it's 81. Go to Richmond's 95 and your interstate. Um, I would hope somewhere in here that from the processes that we created in Hampton Road, 17 municipalities, 1.7 million people, that they would be able to transition some of that to the Order. Now, I was wondering, um, is there any recommendation coming out of uh, the Department of Transportation for, uh, like, when we have the Transportation Planning Organization, where we, you know, organizations, uh, or municipalities within those organizations, bring their own funds? I mean, I, if you think of I-64, which is an interstate highway, it used to be funded by the federal government and the state, governments of Hampton Roads are now paying well over 60% of that and all of the $3.6 billion worth of tunnel and many others. Um, the, it, it seems to me that if we want something bad enough, that the state's always struggling with funding, it's going to fall on the municipalities to pay for this. So I'm not familiar with anyone in the sense of the municipalities that I saw, but it would seem to me there'd be a phased approach for, for the projects if they want it bad enough. Also, in certain areas, maybe around Rono, uh, where they would end up funding the projects, that, the portions that they want. Because, I mean, that's something we've learned that if you want to get it done, I never thought I'd see it in a lifetime. I see a tunnel again, uh, a project that magnitude. Largest design build in the country, if not this world. Yeah, it's huge. Mm -hmm. What do you about tunnels? $3.6 billion, and it's all being funded by the 17 municipalities that have to run, not the state although we're always got our hand off. But I would seem to me that you would want to, I mean, it might be some of that be used. Well, the whole point behind the 81 study is to not only identify the capital improvements that have to be made, but the funding. So the legislators, we've had 12 public hearings. We're looking at the quarter. It crosses three plans, <coughs> three transportation districts, Stanton, Salem, and Bristol. They're all working together. The legislators are all working together to identify a funding mechanism. One of the issues really has been a discussion in Richmond, Fredericksburg, you know, could we amend that? That would be a legislative change um, to do that. But, you know, the legislators along 81 are finding a way to do it without um, having to even change that. They don't have the same, 81's a very, it doesn't have the same congestion that 
um, a 64 or a 95 or a 66 has, has unreliability, complete unreliability. We could fix one stretch of road and you could go down five um, interchanges and the accident's there. It's just, that is the real challenge to this. But I will say that it's an opportunity, um, I think, for our secondary roads and our primary roads or quarters of statewide significance beyond our interstates. Um, we did a connectivity study in, hello, Mr. Nelly. I was telling folks here, I still have to say the message on my hand. I know, exactly, exactly. Although I have to tell the whole story before I share what's on the message. But um, we did a connectivity study for the Lynchburg region and looking at eight modes of transportation. So when we're making transportation decisions, we have the Office of Economic Development, we have local governance there, we have the Business Alliance there, we have the airport there, we have everybody there as we're making transportation decisions. Part of what we learned in the study was the reliability of 29, 501, and 460 was greater than that of 81. And sometimes I think within, and I'm building this connectivity concept into our VTrans planning, in our more rural areas, in rural counties, because you all have something to market that other places don't have. And Meg could tell you the challenges of living on a congested quarter, right, in economic development. And you gave, you stood up at a public hearing and said, we don't want to be known for this, right? And it's so true because they have so much going on in this With region. Young people that are in Florida or is tremendous and I think we have to flip how we talk about this because the improvements you're making are actually what opens up the entire system for 58? Yes. You brought up 58? Mm -hmm. Trying to get a connector road two and a half miles to 58 mm -hmm. is a challenge for me that I really want to overcome. I always tell my team, how do we get to yes? How do we make this happen? Um, but when Barry Hill is, I know there's a gentleman from Pennsylvania County Maybe he stepped out. He was a, he introduced himself. But um, Barry Hill is a the only tier four mm -hmm. mega site in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I can't get a connector road to it. And part of when businesses are looking for the mega sites, ready made sites with all the infrastructure in place, you know, they start out, are you connected to an interstate? No. Do you, you know, go work for something? But anyway, theory, what are the three? I'm sorry, we have two. I was just thinking. Right, two. <laughs> so connected sorry. to an interstate and, and what's the second one? Is it worth it? But I assume two. But anyway, um, but part of what I would say is on the application, what it needs to say is the only highway in Virginia built to interstate standards that has capacity. Right. You can't beat the capacity on 58. No. I wanted to take a picture and just Put it out on the video center. So somewhere the investments, the smaller investments in rural Virginia and um, those that have the urban crescent are incredibly important. It could be the rural electric. That's where businesses want to be. But I do think it's a shift in how we describe it. You know, we may not be on the interstate. Lynchburg is the largest city in the country not connected to um, an interstate. But we're still recruiting businesses because of the reliability of um, years ago, when we had these presentations, uh, if you saw the charts that talked about how maintenance was consuming all the finite dollars and construction has become lower and lower going in the future. So I haven't heard the maintenance topic today, but again, is that not the, the beast that's consuming your budget as yesteryear, or how is that being secured as we try and do all these new projects? Well, because of 2313, we are maintaining and meeting most of our targets except on secondary roads. I know we can do a better job there. So we are right now meeting it. Um, it is going to be an issue, however, of construction that by the chair that you know, the, the amount of money going into construction is diminishing. Going to every year, you would have a pot of $400 million. It would be very hard to disperse those dollars. But um, 
as we are bringing more capacity on, the 64, um, all, you know, 81, we're bringing new roads or new arterials and more capacity into the system that we maintain. Yes, it is going to be, which is going to be part of the B-Trans study on how we can develop the system. Along the lines
to get to fully automated, but fully autonomous, we are not there yet. We do a lot of testing in Virginia for autonomous vehicles, um, underwater, space, air, radiation, land. We are a, because we have such an incredible platform, we're trying to bring more research here, our pilots here, um, business development opportunities. So the fact that we have not regulated this, but we're open to having it tested is very positive. So we're trying to approach it, I think, from that perspective. Any further questions? I've got a little bit of different questions. Yes, uh, more here for Foley County. We don't have It's so lane. beautiful here. Yes. We don't have four lane roads that comes to our county. Uh, we're only 15,000 people in our county, so we The board has really worked hard on trying to improve the development of the majority of our citizens across our county. Uh, and so we, we uh, over the last few years, we've really put a lot of money to the development of the Commerce Park and the building And uh, we've got a pretty good broadband system in the town now. But the one thing that's really important is that about 70% of the people who are in the facilities that are at the site, and so we've got about 20 miles of the And uh, the road in our town Well, and that's part of my two and a half mile road back here in the Nocturne because it's, it's a small road, no traffic, but imagine the economic development. Yeah, it would
Federal Highway Trans the Transportation System, um, which is all gas tax, by the way. Just putting that out there to y'all. Uh, in fact, I'm calling to USDOT, we're trying to see if we can partner on some sustainable funding issues, maybe use Virginia as a pilot, save us some money. But um, that, to me, is the greatest impediment. We had the FAST Act, so it's, um, it's still flowing to 2020, so we still have the money coming into 2020. And then, <clears throat> it's not fully funded. All of our six-year improvement plans that I talked about have this, that federal money kind of built into our plans. So it's very challenging. I did go with the governor more than up to the White House when there was the announcement of the infrastructure package. <laughs> and um, they, have, they had a lot of incentive programs where we came in with 80% and the federal government did 20. There was some rural money, so we advocated for 81, and that is water projects, quite frankly, for water infrastructure. Um, we had some green money, we tried everything, but nothing was way forward. I'm really hoping that maybe, um, with everything going on in Washington, maybe we could agree to the infrastructure program. Um, there's so much more to it. But we would love that. But uh, I'm getting a signal over here. Do you have a do you have a contact? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will hope we can give uh, Secretary Valentine a round of applause.